morning, everyone, to this week's edition of Coffee with Jim and James. James and Scott, before we get going, as usual, I'm going to tell a quick story. When traveling the South Pacific Seas in my schooner, you all know about my schooner, I was on my way from Manila to Perth, and then it hit me that there are rhinos down there. And I looked it up. I asked people. They said, Borneo has rhinos. So I started asking people, asking people, then sailed weeks down the seas to Borneo. Got off, asked them, I said, where can I find a rhino? And they were like, oh, you know, go east. Traveled east, days, found a village. They said, go north, you know, travel, travel. Kept asking for where the rhino is. Finally, I'm in the middle of the jungle. And I mean, I'm out there. It's been months on the road and in the, in the schooner. As I'm going through the jungle, all of a sudden I see a shimmer. And I'm like, it's got to be the rhino. They've been talking about it. It's up here. And I peeled back the jungle. And what was in front of me? Well, it was yellow, I think. Looked like it was in still good shape. It said, dig safely, rhino markers. That wasn't the rhino I was looking for, but I was amazed that rhino markers were throughout the world. You see what I did there, James? I did back up. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I did. I saw it. Unfortunately, I saw it. Uh, Scott Landis is joining us today. Scott is, uh, well, it's, it's too technical for me to break down. So I'm going to let Scott break it down of what, what his role is currently for Rhino Markers and also uh, infrastructure resources. Scott, welcome to the show. Welcome. Great. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thanks, Jim. Uh, glad to be here. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your trip on the schooner. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the Infamous schooner. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I am actually currently with uh, Rhino. I'm president and uh, director of market development for our bigger entity that we're now a part of, which is the Presco family. And I am still the um, president of infrastructure resources. So um, I kind of it got into the damage prevention universe after getting my uh, master's in damage prevention. No. Uh, actually, um, a friend from college um, badgered me for a few years back in the early 80s to come to work for his dad's company, which at the time was Carsonite, who had um, introduced fiberglass, pipeline, and cable markers because everybody had been using metal posts. And so I moved to Carson City, and uh, I, I spent eight years um there in Minneapolis with with uh, Carsonite, you know, so I kind of got immersed in what I gravitated towards because Carsonite's in the highway industry with flexible delineators and uh, in the trails industry, which I got involved with a little bit, but also in utilities. And I just gravitated to the utilities and particularly the, the, the one calls. And so that kind of got me into the industry. And then they were kind enough to fire me um, back in 1990, um, which turns out to be an awesome thing. Um, So then I started Rhino um, from scratch, although our our official name was RepNet Incorporated because I, when I really started, uh, you know, it was just me and I had no money. I had, I had debt and two little kids and thankfully a really supportive wife who had a job. Um, So I thought what I knew something about was manufacturers reps in the utility industry. And so I thought, well, you know, I could act as a kind of a sales manager for a bunch of companies who maybe they make, uh, you know, a hundred products and they think a couple of these could be in utilities and and you guys know, like, so they think they can go make a call on, you know, your alma mater, uh, Jim Centerpoint, and certainly I'll just show them my traffic cone and, and they'll start buying them, right? Well, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, maybe two or three years later after 100 other calls, um, but it's a long, slow cycle. So my idea was to go to these manufacturers and say, hey, look, you're going to pay me next to nothing unless we sell something and you're going to pay part of the expenses. And if you're willing to wait a year or two, we, we may get you in. And so that was kind of the impetus behind RepNet, which is why the name was that is it was short for, uh, you know, a rep network. Um so that's, that's really how I started back in, in 1990. And, um, you know, kind of at the time I said, I know, you know, one thing for sure, I have no interest in getting in manufacturing. 
I don't know much about it except I've watched it. I'm I'm not going down that road. And of course, I was vocal about it. So you know, as soon as you start saying that, that's what you're going to end up doing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, as things evolved, we started finding kind of doing contract manufacturing or having contract manufacturing done. We started like in a guy's warehouse in Lakeville, Minnesota. Then a guy's garage in Savage, Minnesota. And then um, the Senior Citizen Center in Wasika did a lot of assembly for us, uh, which is a town about 70 miles south of uh, Minneapolis. Um, and then we ran out of space and the farmers, the retired farmers who were just awesome, they could really only sit and a lot of the work was standing. So we, we was pretty funny. We leased space in what, what used to be this EF Johnson, they, like the Kings of CB radios. I don't know if you remember that, but you know, like a half a million square foot building, we got 5,000 square feet out in their big open area and it was very well protected. They had barricade tape around our 5,000 square feet. <laughs> That's all we had. We got to use their forklift. And uh, and then in the meantime, we, we uh, started actually building a building across the street and moved into that. And it was, I don't know, it was probably around that time when we were starting to confuse customers because we'd go on sales calls and RepNet didn't sound like a manufacturer. Um, and at one point we had a rep called RepTech and so I'm going on a sales call with RepTech and RepNet and the customer saying, well, who actually makes anything here? You know, <laughs> so we rebranded. Um, and of course, it was really sound logic to the rebranding. I actually had a patent on a garment bag cover um, so that you could check your garment bag and they wouldn't destroy it and you could shove extra stuff in and all that. And when I did that, it was. I was shooting for the kind of banana republic thing and ah, my wife I yeah. Going. yeah yeah yes right so fortunately my wife was a, a super talented graphic designer which she did for a living and so she made this awesome logo we came up with the name rhino garment bag armor and it was super cool uh, logo and this is back when you had, like actually had to draw it and it was a big deal to, to do a logo um, so then I'm thinking well I got this logo that says rhino garment bag armor, armor rhinos are tough our markers are tough so I just changed it to, you know <laughs> damage prevention basically and all I had to do was swap out the uh, marking and protection systems with the uh, travel armor and boom we we, uh, we had a logo so that's that's how we ended up with with Rhino, and it's a different logo now because she made me um, she made me upgrade it to get with the times. Although I still like the classic, uh, but anyway, it was kind of James uh, is all about rebranding. Yeah, I just uh, we we just went through the same thing with our company, and it was a hard, it was some of the hardest days. When it's you emotional. Have to put those old logos to bed and and bring out those new looks, but I get it. For sure. Yeah, we did it ourselves yeah, this year. That's, that's nice. Yeah. Scott, that's awesome. When we were in the pre-show, Scott asked, he said, uh, how how far do you want me to go with that story? Um, I think that was perfect. Uh, who, th who knew we were going to get the entire origin story <laughs> of Rhino Markers? I think it's awesome. Um, I've always been a fan. Um, I met some of the guys out, out on the road, uh, of course, Nick. Uh, and what, what y'all done in the video side of things has been awesome to see. Very refreshing. That's what I like yeah. about it. Yeah. Just different and uh, brave. You know, we talk about being brave a lot. And I think that was very brave, uh, that, that port. Uh, Jim, well, it was brave of me to let them. Uh, let oh, them I tell you what, that's what I mean. I'm talking about you. Uh, <laughs> the acting is a whole nother. That's, uh, I don't even know if that's brave or, or what, but, if that is. Uh, the dead body one where they're going to call before they dig and to bury a dead body. That yeah. one just about had me in stitches. I, I'm like, there are really? several. Yeah. I'm like, that, was, gonna, uh, that and, was pushing the limit. Well, Spencer's our creative genius. And you know, that name. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, he would come in with ideas and uh, I, I'd have to filter them and um, yeah. just the general idea. And we only had to do a little bit of editing, but what you'll notice is like, 
Nick and Chris and Dan and Tommy, mean, like all of our uh, damage prevention cons consultants, they're just awesome actors. And you will notice you don't see me because I suck. I am not a good actor. <laughs> and Spencer tried a couple times and then he realized, A, I don't want to do it. And B, there's a reason I'm not good. <laughs> And those we, made, we made Jim uh, act over the holiday season. We did an internal video and it really turned into a production and we had to do it all remote. So it was all on Zoom type of thing. And it was very, uh, Jim has a whole new respect, I promise you, for actors and, oh my goodness. and their profession. The retakes and and mm -hmm. the worst part is in, in that environment, it's, it's good, it's being recorded then all edited together. Yeah. Where in this, if I make a little blurb it's not a big deal we just keep going we're there right. like i would get 90 percent of the way through then say the wrong word and james is like uh you didn't Sorry. say energy i'm yeah, like what did right. i say you know so <laughs> do it over yeah like, well, it. the my one video that i was actually in was pre-spencer when uh, whitney who's now on the infrastructure resources side who's awesome and made some really good videos with zero training but they decided we were entering a the CGA video contest. And they, of course they wrote all the script and they told me the story and I said, okay, that sounds great. And they said, yeah, um, but you actually have a part here. Oh, now I'm not as sold. And it was, it was a back to the future theme. And uh, so I got to be uh, the guy with the messed up, yeah. the professor, whatever his name yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I said, oh, great. So I, we were shooting it actually in Tom Preston, our, one of our telephone damage prevention consultants garage with this old car. And Whitney is like just awesome, creative, best personality and ever, you know, and real straight laced. And I, I knew this, so she's filming and I can't remember what my first line was, but it was something about the car. And, and I looked right at the camera that she's holding and I used some colorful language that she was not expecting. Oh, her eyes just got yes. that big. Cut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. it scares thinking, me because that's out there somewhere, and I I hope it never surfaces. Yes, the, the blooper <laughs> reels are yeah, the blooper reels are something else that we got out <laughs> of that. Jimmy, I'm gonna let you jump into the to the next. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you touched on something just a second ago. Infrastructure resources. Mm -hmm. All three of us. Uh, live eat and breathe where we have at conferences and networking and you know all those good things and infrastructure resources is quite a uh, mainstay in it and that is uh one of your i'll call it babies give us mm -hmm. a little highlight about that as well as what's going on for 2021 and maybe beyond yeah yeah no yeah thanks uh jim yeah the, yeah, the so it really started back when i was uh you know in the, in the early rhino days um i was working with underground focus magazine writing a column on identification which seems really crazy that anybody would read it but he wanted me to do it so um i you know our industry really didn't have a trade show back then right. you know there was a one call symposium that had gone away and a couple things but so i said mm, you know i had a buddy who had a trade show company so i went to him and said hey what do you think and he said, yeah, I think you might be right. And then I said, well, I don't know how to do all the content. So I went to the owner and publisher of Underground Focus at the time, Ron Rosencrantz, and said, hey, this would be great for your magazine to get the visibility. You know how to put the content together. So I married them all together, and it was called the Damage Prevention Convention. Um, Man, I like well, that one. I would yeah. like to bring that one back. That's my, <laughs> my cup oh. of tea right there. I'd make that logo. Yeah, it, it was... Um, it, you know, it turned out it was really good. I was kind of the consultant, you know, the industry consultant, which got us cheaper booths. And in theory, I got a percentage of the profits. And that's when I learned that um, trade shows don't frequently have a lot of profits. Um, so my <laughs> percentage of, of that was not very good, but I, it was basically about getting the industry together and the passion. Yeah. And yes. so that went on for, I don't know, five years, four years. And then my friend had the audacity to sell the business. I mean, mm. you know, what was he thinking? <laughs> and um, He stayed and it was fine. And then he left and another company bought it. And basically they were just a trade show company. They didn't could care less about damage prevention and the industry. And so I had to separate myself from them and they just, they basically went away. They sunk their own ship. And um, 
in the meantime, I was still working with Underground Focus, which was then owned by Mike Parallack and still is. Uh, great publication, and, and Mike has a great locating um, staking you uh, program. And so he was just kind of kicking off this his new location for staking you. So we ended up teaming up and doing an outdoor um, conference, or I, I shouldn't say conference. It was all a demo expo kind of thing. Yep. Super cool, but it was in an it was literally in a neighborhood like that's be, used to be the, the like the funny farm, honestly, in in, in southern uh, just south of Chicago. He, Mike said, yeah, when you were bad, when you were a little kid, your parents would tell you, you better shape up or you're going to end up in Mantino. Um, so we were doing all these demos in, in like yards and in the boulevard and it was great. And again, I learned, well, the people who attended loved it because they watched all this stuff live, but there was no conference part. So the only revenue came from the exhibitors, which meant we lost money. <clears throat> and at the end of it, Mike just said, you know, I never want to hear the word trade show again. Um, so I said, well, I think I kind of like this. I did the other one. So I bought, I paid off the loss <clears throat> and I bought the show and gave him back my phantom stock that I had in the magazine and um, did the live event a couple more years, but we had to move it because being in the neighborhood had a lot of minuses too, like kids running around. And um, so we eventually, my goal was to kind of replace the damage prevention convention. And so I had to have sessions. And so we ended up um, in at the LA County Fairgrounds um, and had indoor sessions and still the live demos out in their racetrack. And a funny damage prevention aside to that is so um, I ended up there because my uncle used to be the operations manager there and he told me about it and I said, awesome, he had retired. So now we call in locates and do all the right things. And I go to the fairgrounds and said, so out in the middle of this track infield, it was, I mean, it's a big deal. It's like the biggest county fair in the country. There must be some buried stuff. No, there's not. And I'm looking around at these lights all around the track and kind of going, hmm. I'm thinking there are. So I call my uncle and he goes, oh, God, he said, there's high voltage cables, there's fiber, there's everything <laughs> under the sun. So I, I went back into the, the current operations manager and said, OK, here, here's a piece of paper. You're telling me there's nothing out there. My uncle says there is. So you're going to sign here saying you're assuming 100 percent of all liability if we hit anything. Uh, well, magically, he found a map. So luckily... <laughs> Luckily, because when we were doing a demo, a back a back X truck actually came up on the high voltage cable, and had we not known it, it was there, it would have been a nightmare. So anyway, that that eventually um, morphed into what's now our Global Excavation Safety Conference, which we've been doing since 2006. So yeah, it's been a, a long, fun road with that, and we actually did a conference in um, Australia. Two years ago, it was supposed to be again, I think this year, because we we're doing every other year. And, um, you know, that was fast. We had a, a partner down there, Pelican Corp, and then the one call pro uh, system down there, which is dial before you dig. Um, and I, I tell you, you know, from a damage prevention standpoint, it was, first of all, the Australians are just awesome to start with. So that just makes it all fun, right? But then on, on top of that, um, they had never had anything in, in Australia ever where they had brought all the different stakeholders together to talk, wow. which was crazy. I mean, their one call centers all went out and talked to them all individually and communicated, but they'd never all been in a room. And so it was listening to all those Australians and New Zealand people talk about how awesome this was to all get together and talk. It was like, it was, wow. it really, it was fun. It felt really good. <clears throat> That's awesome. That's awesome hey. to hear, Jim. I'm I'm gonna jump into something because yeah. uh, do it, brother. I, I think he's primed and ready. He's got a couple tangents under his belt. This one should be good. All right, Sky. I'm gonna jump. We we ask a, a question to all of our guests, but uh, I think this one is gonna ring even even better with you. So, um, do you love what you do, Scott? Yeah, yeah. There's no, no question about that. I'm pretty passionate about it. So, uh, yeah, 
And yet you have to level with infrastructure resources because we probably haven't made money for about three years. So if you don't love it, it wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's your driving force. I'm going to ask you one follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we'll get out of here, Jimmy. But yep. um, so, so you, you obviously love what you do. Give us one of your just most rewarding uh, parts over the, I mean, the lot, your career, your whole career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a good question, James. And it's like, <clears throat> I think it's, <clears throat> it's hard to put an exact thing around, but I think it's really, you know, I see it with the, the, the Rhino team, you know, having, having grown and have this, this group of just unbelievably passionate people out there about damage prevention. They're not salespeople, right? They're out, damage prevention consultants and, and they actually believe that and and then you know the people at our plant in Wasika take such great pride and the awesome part is you know I I did sell uh, I, I still have a small part um, in, in March and, and I could because it's just rolling they they honestly don't need me I can still contribute but they don't need me um, and so that was really that combined with the infrastructure resources, you know, bringing the whole industry together at these conferences and seeing what our team does to put all these sessions together and the impact it makes. And, you know, at infrastructure resources, our, our mission is saving lives through education. And it's kind of one of those things where everybody's got a mission, right? But we actually live and breathe um, that mission. And it's just fun, you know, to see this thing going on. If I get hit by a bus on, on the way home, uh, it's going to keep going and they do a great job. And, and that's probably the most rewarding thing is to see that what we do for the industry. I love that. I, I absolutely love it. You know, you know, Scott, I, I'm sitting here and your passion when we're together in person, you know, flows out of you, but it's still flowing out. And even in this, uh, virtual context you can still see it hear it understand it look at your facial expressions you absolutely do love what you do you love our industry you love making things better and keeping people safe and that's absolutely wonderful thank you so much for being our guest today we yes, are sir. absolutely honored it was uh, awesome to meet you scott yeah it was absolutely a pleasure hopefully <laughs> hopefully out in the wild soon we will meet yeah, again. i hope so <laughs> Looking for that rhino? Anyway. <laughs> Audience, thank you for tuning in this week to another great episode. Scott was fantastic. Join us next week on Coffee with Jim James for another very special guest. Until then, oh, do hit the like button. You know, all those likes and followers do make a difference. Until next week, have a great week. And above all, as I always say, stay safe. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Scott.